Hi, welcome everyone to the first Financial Pod video. Today we're presenting our short thesis on TCF Financial Corp. We believe this is a high conviction and very lucrative trade. I'm glad to be joined by our analysts, Taylor Watson, who recently graduated from Nottingham University, where he was also part of the high performing oil fund in the Nottingham Economics and Finance Society. Hannah Nicky Chook, who is currently studying at the University of Manchester, and notably was ranked in the top five for the global market simulation at Amplify Trading. And last but not least, Bethany Esperitu, who is currently studying at King's College London and has completed several internships in the financial sector. We're going to present this in a Q&A style format, starting with the broad financial sector and then honing into TCF Financial Corp to give you a firm understanding of the thought process behind this trade. We'll then finish with a summary and how you can make money from this thesis. OK, let's start with a broad picture. Hi, Bethany. Please, could you kick it off by talking us through the financial sector? Hi, Ken. Yeah, sure. So the financial sector is very broad, but it can be divided into three main subsectors, which are banks, insurance companies and diversified financials. So banks make up the largest portion of the sector. And this group includes companies that consumers commonly think of as banks and institutions that specialize in mortgages. So banks make money on the spread between the interest it pays and the interest it charges to customers as well as from other services it offers to depositors and lenders. The insurance industry group includes insurance firms, brokers, and companies specializing in reinsurance. So insurance companies generate income through the premiums they receive from buyers of insurance policies and from the investment portfolios they maintain to service buyer claims. Lastly is diversified financials. So this group comprises all the other financial institutions that don't fit into the other categories. Examples include credit rating agencies, asset management firms, and investment banking firms. And what are some of the key drivers for the financial sector? So the performance of the sector is closely linked to economic performance and macroeconomic factors. Some of the drivers that affect their profitability um, would be interest rates, unemployment, regulation, and consumer confidence. Where are these key drivers heading? So in the absence of a vaccine and risks of further outbreaks, many economies are likely to be recessionary for a long period, which would impact the drivers. So interest rates are expected to stay low as the Fed announced that it would keep them near zero through 2022. And this would affect the net interest income of banks, as well as the return on fixed income assets, which are largely held by financial institutions. Next is the unemployment rate. So this is expected to remain elevated for the years to come, and this would impact the probability of loan defaults, which is important for us to consider, especially for companies that have high exposure to unsecured loans. The next driver is consumer confidence. So this rose more than expected last month, but the sentiment still remains well below pre-pandemic levels. And this could be quite unsteady in the coming months, especially as we are starting to see new outbreaks and greater uncertainty. Lastly is regulation. So all firms in the sector are bounded by regulatory constraints, which could impact their profitability and valuation. So in terms of regulation, we could expect changes that move towards a business model that adapts to the new economic reality, which may involve firms having to place heavier focus on customer needs and the innovation of payments. Finally, how do you think the performance and outlook for the financial sector fares going into the future? So the performance and outlook of the sector over the next years will largely depend on the rate at which economies recover and how quick financial institutions are able to adapt to changes in the new normal. So expectations for a quick recovery would serve as a strong tailwind to performance and there will be high growth potential, but only if interest rates recover and the overall market continues to advance. Thank you very much. Interesting stuff. Now, moving on to the retail banking industry analysis. Taylor, please could you explain the competitive environment within this industry? Cheers, Ken. We've always seen a few top banks dominate the retail banking industry thanks to their economies of scale, large investments in brand and infrastructure. But the scale economies have their limits. So we've seen the likes of Bank of America, Wells Fargo and JP Morgan Chase all operate with similar market share and efficiency ratios. But now what's going to happen with the shift to digitalization, which is supported by the large advancements of tech in the banking sector, will squeeze out undifferentiated mid-size and smaller competitors. These are early signs uh, of this trend with, it, with 
Undifferentiated smaller community banks in the US have lost a significant share of their deposits over the last two or three years, whilst the three largest share, uh, largest banks have gained share. These reasons are twofold. First, advances in technology such as machine learning and artificial intelligence that are unleashing a new wage of productivity improvements for financial institutions. The second and most important factor is the shift from physical to digital channels of customer acquisitions. Banks with scale and skills in leveraging this advantage will achieve customer acquisition significantly lower than smaller competition. And what is the bargaining power of the buyers and suppliers in, the, in this industry? So when we're talking about the bargaining powers of either the buyers or suppliers, we're referring to how much power their, our customers have over us to what extent they can dictate terms. And retail banking is unique as their customers are also the suppliers as per their business model. They take money from the suppliers and loan it out to their customers, which are usually overlapped. In the retail banking industry, suppliers and customers have little power as individually if they left the damage would be insignificant, but it is important that they not allow mass exits, exits as this would seriously dampen their profits. What is the threat of substitutes for retail banking? So the threat of substitutes has vastly increased in recent times in the form of new firms that provide specialist financial products. So instead of being able to be in a bank and providing a range of products that are specialised on one, this can be seen in peer to peer lending companies such as Prosper and Lending Club, to name a few. PayPal and Apple are now offering debit cards. One particular example that I feel will be particularly hit on revenue will, uh, and the growth is the companies that are offering short-term credit. These companies include PayPal, Amazon, and Klarna, and they offer these at checkout, and by offering a more integrated service at checkout, they will allow, allow them to capture a lot more market share of the traditional method of using credit cards. Okay, looks like there's some big headwinds there. Finally, what about the threat of new entrants? So traditionally, retail banking has been a hard market to penetrate and has been surrounded by a large metaphorical moat for many years. But, this uh, but in the techno technological age, it has seen to bridge this gap and has given rise to many digital challenger banks. These include N26, Monzo and Chime. They offer similar services with more ease and don't have to incur the cost of brick and mortar storefronts. They also erode away the market share of small and mid-cap retail banks, with us likely to see some large-scale winners emerging within the next five years. Okay, brilliant stuff. Cheers, Taylor. Now we have a broad perspective of the financial industry and the current conditions for retail banking. Bethany, please could you begin the stock-specific analysis by explaining TCF's business model? So TCF is a financial holding company that resulted from a merger between TCF Financial and Chemical Financial. They engage in the provision of banking services through their subsidiary TCF National Bank. So TCF Bank provides a full range of consumer facing and commercial services, including consumer and commercial banking, trust and wealth management. And they also offer specialty leasing and lending to consumers, small businesses and commercial customers. On their consumer banking side, they primarily aim to generate deposits and provide high quality loans. Um, the deposits are generated from consumers and small businesses to provide a source of low cost funds for them. While on their commercial banking side, they focus on building full commercial relationships, providing high quality loans and providing deposit and treasury services. Okay, and what about the geographical diversification of TCA? So TCF Bank operates bank branches primarily located in Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, Ohio, Colorado, and Wisconsin. So these are their primary banking markets. They also conduct business across all 50 states and Canada through their specialty lending and leasing. In relation to COVID-19, the states in which TCF mainly operates all have a reproduction number or R value above one, which means that an outbreak is growing and cases rise exponentially. So this is not a good sign for them as they are a mid-cap bank that makes loans to a lot of SMEs, which would eventually suffer the most from a rise in cases, especially if lockdown measures will have to be reinforced. So it's difficult for these um, small businesses as they don't operate with a cash cushion that allow them to withstand the effects of a major revenue disruption, which would increase the risk of loan defaults. Interesting. And um, what is the TCF management team like? So their management team consists of individuals who have been working for TCF Financial and Chemical Financial for many years. Their CEO, Craig Dahl, for example, has been with TCF since 1999, and their COO was the former president of Chemical Bank. Their CFO, Dennis Glaser, was um, the previous CFO of Chemical, Chemical Financial up until their merger with TCF. 
and he is expected to step down as their CFO in October. However, they don't really know why this is the case. Thank you very much. Next up, Taylor, what's been going on with the insider ownership? So what we've seen from inside the company by no means signal confidence by the senior staff. As you can see by the graph on the screen, there's been little insider buying since mid-2017. And in the last three quarters, no senior staff have purchased shares of the company, despite the shares trading at a large discount, which is over 40% year on year, which reaffirms our view on TTF future. Okay, and what about the institutional ownership? So institutional ownership makes up 84% of all outstanding shares at TCF. We've seen that two out of the three of the largest institutional shareholders have decreased their positions. However, it must be noted that this is not conclusive by any means and could have been for a number of reasons given the size of these institutions. Okay, and what about the so-called smart money? What are their hedge funds doing? Well, Ken, this is much more interesting and more convincing. It's always interesting to look at the levels of confidence hedge funds have within a company as their holdings are a much greater percentage of their total assets under management and they also have a much shorter time horizon in terms of profits than larger institutions. And what we've seen by the 13F filings, there is, there's been a drop of 21% in hedge fund support of TCF. So again, this is a positive sign for us and it shows support in our short thesis. Okay, interesting stuff. Cheers, Taylor. Hi, Hannah. Uh, please could you talk us through TCF's business strategy? I can, sure. So introduced in 2015, TCF's four strategic pillars, diversification, profitable growth, operating leverage, and core funding represent the basis for its business model and strategic decision-making process. We have identified current business strategies for TCF, which include execution costs, and business synergy initiatives from the merger of equals. Next, to provide consistent cu customer experience by the end of the year. However, the migrated integration activities to work from home might indicate that the process could be lengthier and more costly than anticipated. Lastly, to maintain strong capital levels and pay a competitive dividend. As to the response to COVID-19, TCF offers loan modifications for impacted customers, having received 8,500 commercial loan modification requests, as well as mortgage and home equity payment deferrals with 7,300 requests for $825 million. Moreover, they have increased provision for credit losses, $74.1 million related to COVID-19. And lastly, TCF had temporarily suspended share buyouts. What about the competition? Who are TCF's com uh, competition? And how does TCF stack up against its peers? We have identified five main competitors of TCF with a similar market cap, which are People United Financial, First Horizon National, Citizens Financial Group, Zion's Bank Corp and TFC Financial, which operate under similar business models, however, still provide a wide range of services represented on the slide. When comparing the performance of TCF over the past two years to one of their main competitors, Zion's, it's clear that even though that they are moving in somewhat similar trend, TCF was hit harder by dropping its share performance from 130% to minus 10% during a COVID recession. Having completed a comparative analysis on TCF and five other competitors mentioned, we have identified that TCF is performing below the average performance overall amongst most of the ratios examined. Namely, TCF has the lowest dividend yield of 3.81%, as well as return on assets, return of equity, PE, PS, EPS, and quick ratios, all performing well below the average of the peer group assessed. However, among its competitors, TCF has the highest insider ownership percentage of 3.39% and the highest net interest margin of 3.81%. Okay, nice. We've covered a lot of ground today. Please could you sum up what we've talked about so far? To sum up everything, we have identified a bearish macro backdrop for financials. Firstly, one of the issues are lower for longer interest rates, which means further net interest margin compression for banks such as TCF. Secondly, high cyclicality in a time when the business cycle is slowing. This then adversely impacts unemployment and consumer confidence and the volume of banking activity for TCF. On top of that, 
Within financial sector, retail banking has the most challenges going forward. Particular issues include the rise of non-financial companies providing short-term credit options, as well as the rise of lightweight online banks, which do not have the traditional banking expenses that TCF does. In terms of stock-specific factors, insider ownership of 3.39% 3, of 3 indicates weak buying and a significant volume of selling in recent quarters. On top of that, lockdown rollbacks in six states that TCF operates in are very possible, meaning a slowdown in business for TCF. According to our competitor analysis, ROA of TCF is in the bottom 10th percentile, of US banks within the peer group selected, which includes banks with particularly weak ROA, TCF is still below average. Lastly, there is a room for analyst downgrades, currently seven very bullish, five bullish and three neutral ratings from Wall Street. Given the current outlook for banks, downgrades seem highly likely, which will be a catalyst for downwards movement. Okay, great stuff. What's the DDM? And finally, how can we make money on this thesis? The dividend discount model is a quantitative method used for predicting the price of a company's stock based on the theory that its present day price is worth, worth the sum of all of its future dividend payments when discounted back to their present value. It attempts to calculate the fair value of a stock irrespective of the prevailing market conditions and takes into consideration the dividend payout factors and the market expected returns. The reason why we use DDM model rather than a DCF is because free cash flow is meaningless for financial institutions because changes in working capital can be massive due to the balance sheet centric nature of their businesses. DDM uses the firm's dividend as a proxy for cash flow. So speaking about the assumptions, minimum Tier cap ratio of 12% is based on their current requirements. Cost of equity of 11% is based on peer group analysis. Initial group on tangible common equity of 9% based on their average ROTCE between 2008 and 2009. This then reverts back to their current levels in time. Final year over year asset growth of 4.5% based on historical average of the last three years before their merger. For trade setup, we have decided to capitalize on this thesis by launching a naked short at 32.5 price level. The reason we chose this level is price is losing momentum from a technical standpoint, so it didn't make sense to get in at these lows. And also we get a much more lucrative trade from a risk reward perspective at 32.5. Fantastic, so that concludes our presentation. We hope you learned something new and potentially have a very compelling and lucrative trade to take on TCF Financial. Thanks everyone for watching.